Hi, my name is Kelly Ross. I'm the Director of Loss Prevention for Julius Vigilance Canada, and this is our next learning short segment. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Maria McLennan. Dr. Maria McLennan is a forensic jeweler lecturer at Edinburgh University, Scotland, and service, de sorry, service design manager at the Police Service of Scotland. Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Maria. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to, to, to be here. I say here, I am still in Scotland, but it's a pleasure to be joining you across the pond. Oh, yeah. And, and so we're very excited to hear about your, your line of work uh, that you're in. And um, Dr. McLennan, you are pioneering some very important and fascinating work in the emergent field of forensic jewellery. Can you tell me and our members about your history with jewelry and your expertise in uh, leading you into the forensic uh, jewelry analysis field? Of course, yes, I'd be delighted. Um, so thank you, first of all, um, that's, that's nice to hear. It's always nice when people are interested in, in, in the work that I do. Um, I, I trained originally as a, a bench jeweler. So I trained as a designer maker of jewelry so my background is not as a police officer or even a scientist of any kind. Um, so the, the, the appreciation I have for jewellery, I think, comes from um, learning firstly how it was made and learning how to make it myself. And then being really fascinated with um, how you can almost deconstruct that. Um, so by learning how something was made, you really do get an appreciation for who it was made by, why it was made, um, the materials and the tools and the manufacturing techniques to bring that piece into fruition. Um, so I was always more interested in, in, in that side of things, in why people make jewellery, both historically and in a contemporary setting. Um, as much as I still to this day really love sitting down at the bench from time to time and playing around with jewellery making. Um, it's, it's good fun, it's very therapeutic. Um, I didn't really want to be self-employed or, or, or run my own business like a lot of other jewellery designers were doing at the time. So um, yeah, I had a little bit of a serendipitous career turn. I actually had a lot of my, my graduate collection that I, that I made at art college um, was stolen from um, an exhibition um, in Scotland at the time. And um, I, I guess in many respects, that makes me a, a victim of crime. Um, and there was no real traceability. I was very naive at the time. Um, my pieces were hallmarked, but um, the work I did with the the police came a lot later and it kind of came as a result of my own experiences in, in losing and having my jewellery stolen. Um, I became really interested in how police forces recover lost and found property. Um, and when I went back to university to do my master's, I, I guess I tried to turn that experience into a positive. Um, and I started researching jewellery's use in, in all sorts of different crimes and, and eventually moved into jewellery's value in forensics and human identification. But what a uh, what a uh, amazing road that has taken you to where you are now, you know, and um, it's quite a fascinating field of work. Um, can you uh, talk about some of the applications of it? Yes, absolutely. And um, I think for, for, for me, um, the, the very first thing I do when I discuss this work is almost, um, I, I always think of myself as a, a little bit of a charlatan, actually, because um, I, I'm not a police officer. Um, but from the jewellery side of things, I'm, I'm also not a valuer or an appraiser. Um, I'm, I'm studying gemology right now. And, and the dream eventually is to pursue pursue that 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 route um, and and really develop the technical skills and the knowledge but um over the last few years I've really been learning as I go along as well and the thing that I found so fascinating is I've learned so much more about the jewelry industry through learning about jewelry's involvement in crime um, for example I didn't really know how traceable hallmarks were the idea that you can trace a hallmark back to um, not only the, the place it was hallmarked. So in the UK, we have four assay offices. We have one in Scotland, in Edinburgh, 
um, and three in England. Um, so, for example, we, we initially straight away, we know if something was hallmarked in, in London, in Birmingham, in Sheffield or Edinburgh. Um, potentially, then we can liaise with the assay office to narrow down the, the hallmark, the manufacturer, the designer, the bespoke jeweller. Um, I didn't really know very much about that side of hallmarking until I got involved in policing. Um, and equally, the, the, the personal sentimental aspects of jewellery that really fascinated me. If something had a, a, an engraving or a serial number or an inscription, um, even a photograph in a family locket, um, some kind of unique personal feature. Um, I didn't appreciate that, that that too has an evidential value. We can trace serial numbers um, on, on watches. Um, gemstones and diamonds are now laser engraved at a microscopic level, which is something that's nigh on impossible to see unless you're looking through a microscope, something that isn't really known by thieves. Um, and, and, and yeah, even the, the evidential value of jewellery in, in disasters, at crime scenes, um, those dates, those in inscriptions, those engravings, um, the way something was made, the style, the manufacturing techniques, um, that can narrow down the, the, the geographical or, or regional um, provenance of the item or, or even the age of the item. So all of that really lovely jewellery knowledge that was sitting in the jewellery industry, um, I didn't really appreciate the applications of that in a forensic and criminal context and still, until I started working in, in forensics and policing, ironically. So uh, that, I guess that, that brings me to thinking about cases that you would have worked on. Is there any, uh, and, and I know because it's in the realm of police, you may or may not be able to talk about uh, some of these things, but is there any historical case that um, that really was exciting or that you can let, you know, can share with us a little bit of information about? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so my, my, my day job, I work with um, the Police Service of Scotland um, at the moment. I've worked um, for the police in Scotland in, in various capacities for about six and a half years now. Um, so I wish there was a, a jewellery and gem department. I wish there was a, a real job title of forensic jeweller. And whilst I'm working on that, um, unfortunately, that doesn't um, make up most of my day job right now. Um, however, through my, my academic work um, at Edinburgh University, um, my, my own research started off very theoretical, um, trying to kind of test a lot of these theories in practice was difficult without having um, the experiential um, hands-on practical um, access, I guess, to a lot of, of cases. Um, so I, I retrained in disaster response initially. So I started working out in disaster victim identification. I undertook a number of deployments overseas, um, primarily aviation crashes, but also worked on a number of terrorist in incidents, um, building collapses and, and other mass fatalities. So the first few cases I really started working on were um, trying to understand whether the theories um, of my research were applicable in practice. And I think that was a really important learning curve because um, in DVI, it was the sheer quantity of jewellery items and other personal effects that were recovered that made me really appreciate that some of the time consuming techniques involved in tracing a hallmark or identifying a serial number not particularly um, fast or quick or cost effective. Um, so actually in, in some of the situations and the cases I was working on um, really made me appreciate and, and see in new light how difficult that, that actually was. Um, equally, some of the other things it made me realize were the, the increase in um, mass produced items, um, the lack of these, these high end or expensive pieces, which are, of course, the ones that do tend to have things like serial numbers and hallmarks um, and a lot of cultural and religious um, variations in pieces across the world, which um, we had to be incredibly careful not to make assumptions about 
because uh, a high street in, in Germany now looks very similar to a high street in, in Scotland as it does in Canada. Um, we are beginning to lose that cultural and, and geographic diversity. Um, so when I started to move into on, on more of a freelance consultancy basis, um, working with everybody from sort of missing persons agencies, um, I've, I've, I've done a little bit of informal consultancy as well as formal consultancy. Um, a couple of historical cases from um, the era of capital punishment, that was in more of a public engagement realm, but really interesting to revisit how jewellery and identification techniques that are available now um, might have shed new light on investigations. Um, but I think for me is, is homicide and cold case investigations probably where jewellery can add a lot of value, um, where we don't have the DNA or the fingerprinting or the dental information that we would ordinarily like in a case, either because it wasn't taken at the time, it wasn't available at the time, um, or we simply don't have anything to compare it to. Um, yeah. I think when it's an individual case where we have really nothing else to go on, no other routes or avenues of investigation, for me, I think that's where jewellery has been the most valuable because um, we really do pour the time and effort and, and, and money. Very, very sadly, we should be treating all cases the same, of course, but um, I think it's that tiny little um, clue, that tiny little diamond in the rough that is just glinting there that can provide the first point of an investigation. Um, yeah. Those are the cases that feel really quite um, special. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. You know, that's, um, and there, you know, you think about um, what you're talking about is um, some of the most serious investigations that would be conducted when we're talking about uh, human issues. And uh, to be able to use jewelry and apply that as evidence towards those is uh, spectacular. It's, um, it's uh, really great to see that kind of work being done. So um, what about um, ongoing projects or, or things in the, you know, like, what, do you have any interesting projects on the go right now relative to this? Yeah, yes, absolutely. And um, I think one of, one of the things I've always um, struggled with a little bit, um, partly in, in, in I, I don't want to say getting this field off the ground, because I think it's really important to acknowledge that it seems shiny and new and, and very innovative, but you know, jewellery valuers and appraisers and gemologists are detectives anyway, you know, they've been doing a lot of forensic and detective work for many years. Um, and equally, the police have been, you know, tied up in, in criminal and forensic cases involving jewellery. So um, I think for me, the, the, the thing I like to do is bring those disciplines together. I'm really interested in the knowledge exchange and the intersection that happens um, between kind of the design industry more generally and law enforcement. Although my specific interest is of course, jewelry and gems and forensics and identification. Um, so I would say that the largest project I have at the moment is a collaboration with one of my colleagues, um, a Dutch colleague who's based in Athens, Dr. Jan Bicker, um, and a Greek colleague, Professor Pavlos Pavlides, who's based in Evros in the north of Greece. Um, so we have just received a, a small amount of funding to explore um, how we can enhance the evidential value of personal effects items, primarily jewellery, that have been recovered um, very sadly on the bodies of, of unidentified migrants. Um, so particularly in the Mediterranean basin, but of course ac across the world, um, the, the increase in migration um, is, is seeing, you know, all sorts of border issues and between Greece and Turkey is no different. Um, there's a particularly treacherous migratory route um, that, that's become known as the River of Death between Turkey and, and Alexandropoli in the north of Greece. And very sadly, a lot of migrants um, coming over from primarily Iraq, Iran, Syria, Afghanistan um, lose their lives along this border. Um, so this is very much a collaboration with Professor Pavlidis, who is the local pathologist in the area in Greece. 
um, Dr. Bicker, who um, runs a charity dedicated to enhancing the, the awareness of the, the barriers to identifying missing migrants, um, and myself from the, the, the jewellery and the personal effects um, angle. Um, mm -hmm. We have a number of items that we've recovered, whereby we have a lot of prayer beads, um, jewellery items that we suspect are amulets or talisman, um, protective in some way. Um, we have a lot of scripts and verses from the Quran, um, small scrolls with what we suspect are, are prayers rolled up and hidden or concealed or sewn into the lining mm -hmm. of, of personal effects. Um, so it's a project really looking at the design of those items and, and trying to identify everything from provenance to language to um, whether there's even DNA potentially um, and seeing if we can't identify some of these individuals, but also potentially reunite with the families, um, yeah. the, the, the names and give, give the nameless back their name. Yeah. And, and, you know, I was talking earlier about how fascinating your work is, but, you know, after you describing that, it really is about how important that kind of work is. And uh, thanks for sharing that. That's, uh, that's amazing. Um, so what about the future? So, you, you know, you've come from here to there and you're working on these great projects. What do you see in, in the future? What do you hope to see? I mean, you, you talked about, uh, uh, I heard you, you mentioned a dedicated position in, in policing and these kind of things. What do you see for the future of this, this type of work, forensic jewelry analysis? I mean, the, the dream is absolutely to combine the, the, the various sporadic um, packages of work, I guess, and, and, and do that, do that full time. I would love to see it become something that um, is embedded within the police service itself. Um, I think with a lot of academic or, or expertise at the moment, it, it is still something that sits slightly outside and on the sidelines. And I think as long as the police are, are taking an interest, I think that's great. And I think whether it sits inside or it sits outside, I think the important thing is to raise awareness and make sure that people are taking an interest. Um, for me, um, there's, there's a number of other projects I'm involved in right now. And one is of course, to continue hopefully the collaboration and the, the wonderful discussions I've been having with yourself, Kelly, for a few weeks, a few months now. Um, I think there are so few individuals um, working at the, the intersection of these disciplines that um, to almost begin to build that network of experts and individuals around the world, um, I think people have these interests and they exist in pockets internationally, but to really grow and build that community, um, to make sure that our almost chapters um, in each country, um, where we almost bring together forensic jewellery, jewellery and gem, crime experts. Um, and I think it, it's for me, it's all about that knowledge exchange. It's not only raising awareness amongst the police and law enforcement community about the, the evidential value and potential of jewellery, but about that sentimental and that emotional value we talked about beyond the object, beyond the immediately financial, um, you know, monetary value, mm -hmm. um, I think is so important. But I think it's also really important to flip that and then teach the jewellery community about, um, you know, how to recognize potentially stolen um, items or identify fakes and forgeries or prevent people trying to sell on the, the proceeds of crime. So I think a lot of the work that, that you're doing um, in Canada, I think um, there's a lot of great work happening in the UK. But again, I think um, internationally, it's a little bit siloed. It's a little bit sporadic. I think we can do a lot more to join it up. And I would love to see some kind of international program of activity that look to standardize things and really create dedicated international standards because I don't think we're quite there yet on that front. Totally agree. And <laughs> what, a, what a great um, uh, um, idea or concepts to aspire to. Uh, not, I don't think that far off, but um, as you say, a ways to go yet. Um, yeah, Maria, that, this has been uh, absolutely fabulous. Uh, thank you so much for your time and sharing your, your knowledge and your experiences with us. 
and um, have a wonderful day and look forward to chatting with you again uh, in the near future. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, and, and yeah, I hope to, hope to keep in touch. Thank you. Bye now.